All right, thank you all for joining our webinar today. Um, I'm Alec Bogdanoff, I'm the Florida Director for the American Flood Coalition, and we're here to talk about Florida's landmark Always Ready Resiliency Law. Uh, just a few quick housekeeping notes. This webinar is being recorded. It, it will be available later uh, for folks that were not able to join us today. Also, uh, this will be uh, you know, an opportunity for you all to ask questions at the bottom of your um, screen. There should be a Q&A box. You are welcome to click it and enter Q&A, especially when we're in the panel portion. We'll be watching those and asking questions of the panelists as they come up. So thank you all for joining us today, and it is my pleasure to pass it to Senator Ellen Barzanoff. Okay, so I was not, I was muted. Okay, that's, that's one for the book. Um, <laughs> Let me do that again. <laughs> I am Ellen Bogdanoff. I am a shareholder at the Becker Law Firm and part of the government law and lobbying practice. Um, I am here today to introduce the panelists and our moderator for today. Uh, just to give you a brief historic background on this piece of legislation, um, well, this landmark legislation um, was quite interesting to watch. As the former member of the House and the Senate, I don't think that I have ever watched a speaker priority. Uh, end up with everyone on the House floor pressing the green button as well as the Senate floor. So it was it was historic, it was bipartisan, and uh, I just personally want to thank the Speaker of the House, the Senate President, and our Governor for making an issue as important as flooding and sea level rise a priority in the state of Florida. Um, I, I anticipate that many other states will be taking our lead, and, and that's a pretty exciting thing. Um, I was excited uh, to work with the American Flood Coalition through their oh. advocacy arm to make sure that this legislation had a passable, um, uh, a successful passage. Um, with that, we have a team panel uh, that is going to be talking about this legislation. Uh, first is Representative Christine Hunchofsky. Uh, Christine is a Florida House of Representatives member representing Parkland, Coconut Creek, and portions of Margate and Coral Springs. Christine served as Mayor of Parkland from 2016 to 2020, and in 2019, she became a member of the American Flood Coalition and advocated for flood mitigation legislation in Washington, D.C. Christine earned her bachelor's degree in business administration and philosophy from Boston University and an MBA from Babson College. Um, our next panelist is Representative Demi Usada Cabrera. Uh, Demi is a Florida representative and one of the main sponsors of the All, Always Ready House Bill, and thank you for your work. One of her commitments to the community she represents is to preserve and protect their most precious natural resources and environment. Demi earned a bachelor's degree from Florida State University. Alex Reed is the director of the Division of Water Resource Management in the Office of the Department of Environmental Protection. The office has a multifaceted approach to resilience, including preserving coastal and aquatic management areas and implementing ecosystem restoration projects to prepare Florida's coastal communities and state managed lands for the effects of sea level rise, coastal flooding and erosion and storms. Alex earned her bachelor's degree of science and geology from the Florida State University. Um, then we have our moderator who's gonna be taking over in a few minutes. and. Um, Alec is the Florida director of the American Flood Coalition. He is a policy trained PhD oceanographer and meteorologist. He served as a John A. Mouse Grant Fellow for a United States Senator before returning to Florida. He worked in the political arena for nearly two decades and has extensive experience in science communication. Alec earned his PhD from MIT and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute and his master's and bachelor's degree in meteorology from Florida State University. Alec, I will give you the mic. Thank you, Ellen. It is a pleasure to be here with you all today. Uh, we're really excited to start talking about this landmark legislation that really um, is going to change the way the state of Florida is beginning to prepare for flooding and sea level rise. And so, um, again, folks, um, please use the Q&A box and, you know, ask questions, that's what we're here for. Um, but I do have a series of questions. And so the first uh, is for Rep. Busada Cabrera, which is 
Why was this an important bill for you and, and what did it really mean for you to carry this legislation? Thank you so much. And thank you for having me today and hosting this. You guys, of course, have been instrumental in helping get this across the finish line. Um, you know, this has been an important issue, the environment, the water, the issues that we face as a state. Um, to me, you know, throughout my entire childhood, having been born and raised in Florida, I definitely, you know, grew up appreciating all that Florida has to offer. And then, you know, knocking on doors in my community, which is um, in Miami-Dade County, parts of Coral Gables, Pinecrest, Cutler Bay, Palmetto Bay, South Miami, um, I learned that a lot of the community cares about these same issues and it's important to them as well. Um, so it was important to me to kind of, you know, put a, a a flag in the ground saying that this issue is not only important to me, but our community and our state as a whole. You know, it really doesn't matter if you live on a, in a coastal community or an inland community, this affects all Floridians. And I was beyond honored that the speaker gave me the opportunity to be able to carry this piece of legislation. And, you know, still a little bit in shock that we got it done. I think it was a long time coming for Florida to, to get something like this done. Awesome. Yes. And, and thank you. Uh, I know that this was a heavy lift this session, you know, 60 days goes by awfully fast. Um, so Rep Hunchofsky, you know, as, as a former mayor, um, specifically of an inland community, why is flooding and sea level rise an important issue, as, as Rep Busetta said, not just for coastal communities, but also for inland communities? Thanks, Alec, and uh, thank you for having me, and thank you for all your advocacy in this area. Uh, I also want to thank Representative Basada Cabrera for her leadership in um, navigating our 60 days to make sure something as important as this um, passed, and not only passed, but I think it's important to recognize that it passed unanimously, and that's because every single one of our communities is affected by this. Um, as mayor, uh, we have been through hurricanes and we have also had massive flood events in our community where people couldn't leave their developments just because there was um, excessive rainfall. And so I think often we're talking about sea level rise and we're talking about flooding in the coastal areas, but we forget the inland areas. And when um, we have areas where there's increased development, such as we do currently in the city of Parkland, it's really important that we're not behind the eight ball when we're uh, building, when we're planning and um, making sure that what we're doing is, um, is helping our communities to be uh, resilient going forward so that we're not designing and building for the past, but for the future so that um, we have more resilient communities. And I, I just like to add, you know, we talk about this like it's so far down the road and it only affects certain communities, but it affects um, all communities. And I think that's important to me as somebody who lives inland, I call myself our city um, East Everglades, and um, that we're all affected by it. And it's important for our economies and our communities and um, that we take care of this. And so it's been very important legislation for us. And Thank it's a you. first step, hopefully only. Yes, as, as you know, as robust as this was, I think, you know, that's important to remember. Um, and, and Rep Busada coming back, can you tell a little bit about how this all came together? How, how did we get here with such a comprehensive piece of legislation? Definitely. Well, I have to be honest, there was a lot of groundwork done before I even uh, kind of came into the mix. Um, you know, I was just elected this past November. And this, of course, was a, a huge part of why I ran these issues. And um, we're fortunate that we have a Speaker of the House who made this a big priority um, for, for his speakership. And, you know, I, I'm lucky that there was someone at the top who we saw eye to eye on this. So, you know, I, I reached out and said, I would love to be a part of something. And of course, Alec, you have been involved from um, you know, the get-go and the American Flood Coalition has been instrumental in really helping us understand kind of what do we need to do? Because of course, this is the, the first time we as a state have done anything like this. Um, you know, we've never had any sort of statewide assessment or statewide plan. Um, so we're fortunate to rely on experts like yourself and those who have already 
already been doing a lot of the groundwork and a lot of our regional coalitions and communities um, who have already kind of been at the forefront of some of these issues, helping us come together, okay, and look at what can we do as a state. Awesome. And um, turning over to Alex, first, I also think I take the blame for this. You're now the director of the Office of Resilience and Coastal Protection. I believe we have re renamed um, what what that office used to be. Um, well, now we have really, um, you know, set the framework for the future. But I think it's helpful to talk about a little bit. What did DEP have prior to this um, before we kind of get into the what this means now? Um, sure, and I'll jump right in there, but I, I also would like to thank you for, for allowing me to, to sit on this, this very um, uh, impressive panel, um, so I'm, I'm honored. And I know that our, our agency leadership um, is very supportive of, of our resilience efforts, and we're, we're really excited about uh, the legislative session and the support um, from the legislature and the governor's office to get us through and, and to get us where we are today. Um, to to Put the entire universe of resilience um, uh, from our division perspective, uh, we really have to, to reach back to the 60s. You know, we didn't always use that word, but in the state, we've been managing beaches and inlets for resilience purposes um, since the 60s. Um, so it's really important to look at that, that history that we have as an agency. Um, and then also um, what, what's interesting about the beaches program is that incrementally increasing um, the design templates of our beach projects through time has allowed us to keep up with changes in sea level. And, and that's a great way to move forward on the beaches side of the house. Uh, it's also important to look at our coastal zone management program. Um, we've been um, using uh, federal funds from National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration for years to look at coastal studies uh, to implement uh, living shoreline projects and, and really look at our, our managed areas along our coastline uh, with great support from the federal side. Um, one of the projects um, through the Coastal Zone Management Program actually was the precursor of the Florida Resilient Coastlines Program. Um, I know that was uh, a funded state from the state perspective back in 2018, uh, but the year before that we started a project using federal funds. Um, obviously, the Resilient Coastlines Program has been a huge success um, over the past um, three years. We've been able to disperse about $6.5 million to communities around the state for their uh, planning efforts to address um, resilience and adaptation in their communities. Uh, we've also been able to fund a handful of implementation projects. Um, before uh, this session, uh, we actually had processed um, about 25 new applications for planning grants and 11 implementation projects. So. Uh, we're excited that we have support uh, to run that resilient coastlines program kind of parallel to the new program. Um, and then we also have to look at our, our managed areas uh, where we have been um, implementing living shorelines projects for years. And, and that's kind of our the living laboratory, if you will, of resilience efforts. Um, and then I can't, I would be remiss if I did not mention our coral programs. Uh, so in the Southeast, the, the coral reef is, you know, that first line of defense. And so um, addressing the health concerns with the reef and water quality needs um, around the reef are certainly a focus for the agency. So when you look at that comprehensively, you look at all the facets of the Office of Resilience and Coastal Protection, and we really do have our hands in a lot of pots. No, thank you for that. I think it's, it's uh, you know, sometimes easy to forget that uh, beyond flood protection on land, beaches, that also our coral reef system are just a really important part of that function as well. Um, and so for all of you, I just want to ask, why prepare now? Why is this something that at this moment is important to, to start tackling? And, and Alex, we'll, we'll start with you if that's okay. Oh, I, I, I think we've, in, in so many communities, we've identified challenges with flooding. Um, the, you know, we're, we're witnessing storm events that are becoming more severe. Um, you know, we've, we've been managing the sandy shorelines for years. Um, we see uh, changes to the coastal building zone you know, every three years when the when the, the codes are updated. So we know that we have challenges um, and and it's it's we're anticipating through sea level rise projections, it could get worse. So I, I don't think we have much time to, we don't have any time to lose. We need to start acting now because we're seeing blue sky challenges uh, today um, in many of our communities and not just the coastal communities um, as we've already heard today. So uh, no time to waste. So I like that. <laughs> I like that phrase, blue sky challenges. Rep Panchofsky. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, just to echo that, um, we're kind of a little behind. I mean, we're already seeing how uh, the impacts of flooding are impacting our areas um, where people can't get out of their driveways, can't leave their neighborhoods in these huge uh, rainstorms and things like that. And we also want to make sure that we're, whatever we're doing today is thinking ahead 20, 30 years so that we're not creating a problem, an additional problem 20, 30 years from now that if um, you know, we were planning better today, we could, we could avoid. So I think it's about making sure that we're becoming resilient, but also that we're mitigating um, what we're anticipating in the future currently now. And as we all know, it's a process. Uh, to get everybody on board. And so we need the time now. And I think um, what's really great is that we are talking, you've heard several times today that it's not just one community, it's not just one area. It's something that impacts all of us and it impacts the state as a whole and also the future of the state. Uh, when you think about where businesses want to relocate and where families wanna go, um, you want to make sure that you have an area that's resilient and um, where the economy and the state can thrive. So there's no time like the present and we have a lot of work to do. Awesome. Rep Busada. Thank you. Uh, why now? I mean, <laughs> I think it, it's something that's long overdue, to be honest. Uh, so, you know, I'm definitely grateful that it has finally happened. And I think now it's happened because you know, we're fortunate that we have the leadership in our state that we do that, you know, people on, you know, individuals on each side of the aisle at the, the top, the bottom really saw the importance of finally, you know, getting something done and coming together to, to figure this out. We have more and more people moving to our state each year. Um, the, the dangers are growing and we really can't waste any more time. And as Representative Hunchowski said previously, this, you know, legislation also keeps it not only looking at the present situation, but looking to the future. You know, it, it requires that um, each year a plan for three years is submitted to the legislature. So that way we are continuously looking into the future and never falling behind. And, you know, as the, the legislation is called always ready, um, we have to make sure that we're always ready. Awesome. Yes, I know that that has been a, a theme of this legislation and a really good <laughs> ending point. Um, so before Going into more questions with you, I just want to remind folks that there is a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. You're welcome to submit questions. We have some coming in. And so we'll, we'll start digging through those and uh, push some to the panel in just a few moments. So bo both for uh, Rep Busada and Rep Hunchofsky, you know, now that the budget's been signed by the governor, um, what does this money mean? Like, you know, can you just talk about it in a little bit in the historical contexts of the budget, um, you know, the, I guess now 600 plus million dollars that are a part of this. I don't know which of you want to take the budget question first. Um, so I, I think it means more money into our communities, uh, for sure. I mean, it, it really is an opportunity for us to, to bring more of this money directly into communities, coalitions, things like that, to make sure that they're better prepared and we're building more resilient communities. And of course, um, you know, having recurring funding is amazing. As uh, some of us know, um, you know, recurring funding is harder and harder to come by. So we definitely saw the importance of the issue like this to, to make sure that there is always money here for this issue because it's an issue that Florida is going to continue to face, um, you know, as we, uh, as each year passes. And if I could just add on to that, um, as somebody who comes from local government and we deal with our local budgets every year, you know, we have lots of priorities, lots of competing interests on a local level, like what are we doing for our roadways? What are we doing in all these other areas? So having this additional funding is also giving an opportunity for work to be done that might have been put on the side burner because it isn't seen um, as the top priority maybe in that community. Additionally, um, by highlighting something like this in the budget, you know, they say, show me um, where you're putting your money and I'll tell you what your priorities are. This is signaling to every city and every community and every group across the state of Florida that this is a priority. And I will again go back to, and the fact that it is a completely bipartisan issue 
that it affects every community, no matter where you are in the state of Florida, um, is um, really showing that this is something we have to work toward. And I think uh, that money is going to mean that things are going to happen that maybe wouldn't have had this money not been available. And it's allowing communities to also make this um, the very necessary priority that it is. So we're, I'm gonna pass the, uh, to wrap this out in a moment because we're getting a couple questions about what the legislation actually does um, before we get into implementation. But I think, you know, we talked a little bit about uh, that DEP has historically given about $6.5 million for planning. And I know that this year, I believe the legislature allocated about $20 million for planning. So we're talking about significant dollars going to local governments to really help them start thinking about what this means to them on, on an individual basis. And so um, with that, um, Representative, can you talk a little bit about what this legislation does? What are all of the things that made it into this comprehensive plan? So there are a lot of components to it. Um, one of them is creating the Florida Flood Hub for Applied Research, which is going to be housed at the USF St. Pete campus. Um, they've been doing amazing work. And, you know, we definitely saw the importance of having a, you know, research facility here in our state um, that is, you know, constantly looking at these issues and looking to the future. Um, you know, the legislation also requires, as I had mentioned, and Alex could definitely speak more to, um, you know, what D DEP is going to exactly have to do on their end in logistics, uh, but it requires DEP to submit an annual uh, plan um, for three years to the legislature. And that part of that plan is the, the basis of it is that our local communities will have to submit, you know, different projects will be, which will be assessed on a, on a four tier system by DEP. Um, one of the issues that had come up throughout the, the committee process was those, the community communities who were at a financial disadvantage. So we did do an amendment along the way to um, make sure that the communities that are financially disadvantaged are not disadvantaged when it comes to resiliency, that they are also able to, you know, get funding, um, even if they can't meet the 50-50 matching, um, you know, component of the legislation that was originally in there, because we want, we want to make sure that all of our communities are, are better prepared and building a more resilient, um, you know, community. And awesome. it also creates a trust fund. So I know that was, um, you know, just a, a separate bill. Um, and, you know, of course, we're constitutionally required to have that as a separate bill. But we did create the, a trust fund, um, which the trust fund is funded at $114 million annually. Great. Well, and that, that brings us to, I think, the big question right now, which is, uh, you know, what are the next steps for implementation? And I think along that, one of our uh, attendees is asking, when will guidelines be developed? So Alex, I'll pass it to you. Okay, well, we, we have an exciting year ahead of us. It was such a comprehensive bill. Uh, we're gonna have to um, address this on several different fronts and have several different parallel processes. So I'll kind of walk through those. Let's start with the grant applications for, uh, for uh, grant application track. So um, we are creating a portal. It will be housed on the Protecting Florida Together webpage. Uh, that we've used uh, for the past couple of years to advertise for grant opportunities uh, managed through the department. So we'll have a separate page dedicated to the Resilient Florida program. We'll provide information about the program and that will allow us to accept applications for the, we look at three different pots of money. Um, communities who are uh, working on, on, they need planning grants for uh, vulnerability assessments. That will be kind of one category. Uh, we'll also be uh, looking at applications for resilience projects or implementation projects. And those are those projects that will be prioritized and ranked according to that four tier system uh, that will go into the resilience plan submitted to the legislature each year uh, during session. And then we'll also be accepting applications for the regional uh, resilience coalitions. So um, we're gonna open that portal July 1. Um, we will um, accept applications all the way up until September 1. And they can come from not only local communities, but also the water management districts. So we hope that communities will also coordinate with their water management districts for those submittals. So once we get applications in house, we'll rank them as best we can. Um, and I'll get to that a little bit more in a minute. Um, and then we will prioritize and provide that in those prioritized projects to the legislature in a resilience plan. 
Uh, now the, the first year or two will be kind of a build, building years um, because we will also be working on a rulemaking effort. We need to start that by August 1 so that we can get those the, the entire process for the program and those prioritized uh, or tiered ranking criteria uh, codified in administrative code. Um, so that will take us a little bit of time to get through that process. And that process will provide more details and more, more instructional information for local communities that are submitting applications so they understand that prioritization scheme. Um, and then um, we also have a statewide data set to collect. And this is something we'll be working very closely with the Flood Hub to develop. And we need to start by looking at what information we have um, from existing vulnerability assessments to identify uh, critical assets in our communities, uh, identify regionally significant assets. And then I look at it as kind of a mosaic, take information from the, these vulnerability assessments and then piece them together so that we have a statewide picture of all of our critical assets and regionally significant assets. But the, the challenge there is to look at what assessments have already been done, what has been identified, and then take those data sets and we've got to, to find a way to make them talk together because they may have been collected in slightly different ways or reported in different ways. And that's where we know that the Flood Hub will be a great asset to, to help us with the methodologies for combining those data sets. And then we have to also identify where our data gaps are and then plan for how to get the data to fill in that mosaic so we have that full complete statewide system. And then that date, once we have the data set uh, completed by the end of, of next fiscal year, so by July 1, 2022, uh, we need to complete the data set so that the following year we can move into creating the statewide vulnerability assessment um, and looking at how all of those um, critical assets are impacted by um, sea level rise, flooding, and severe storm events so that we can start looking at adaptation measures that are needed for those critical assets. Um, we'll hope to have that, or we'll, we need to have that um, vulnerability assessment uh, completed by the end of by July 1, 2023 so that by December of 2023, we can have that full three-year resilience plan um, ready for the, legislative, the next legislative session. So in the interim, as I mentioned briefly earlier, uh, we will be using existing vulnerability assessments to prioritize applications that have come in so that we do have interim resilience plans uh, for, for legislative consideration for the next two sessions. So it's gonna be very busy. Um, we are going to need a lot of help from our communities. We're going to need a lot of help from, from you all as practitioners uh, to help us uh, develop this program, um, identify all of the challenges, identify the needs, um, identify what we already have and what we already know uh, so that we can get that comprehensive statewide picture. And we hope to get as much guidance, uh, documentation and information on our webpage as we can um, as we move forward. Uh, with the Legislation was created um, and also uh, came with uh, 25 positions. Uh, so we are in the process of um, uh, getting advertisements ready and on the street so that we can start bringing in our team um, and, and get them uh, up to speed and working as quickly and diligently as possible. In the interim, we'll start working with our um, resilient coastlines team that's already on board uh, with the planning, uh, beginning planning efforts. And, and we're not gonna lose ground while we wait to step up. So we're gonna keep moving very quickly. Um, but it's going to be an exciting year, and um, I, we don't have all the answers yet, but uh, we know that we need assistance from you all to get this um, running and successful and moving the state forward as proactively as possible. Sounds like you just have a little bit to do in the next couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> it's exciting. So, you know, I, I, we talked about July 1, the portal opening. I know a lot of go local governments are asking, what can they do now to start preparing? And, and specifically for those who have existing vulnerability assessments and um, are, you know, know their new state guidelines, what can they start thinking about? Uh, great question. And, and what I really like about this legislation is that um, it makes it very clear uh, to communities what exactly we need for a vulnerability assessment so that we can get that, that statewide picture. And, and one of the challenges in the, the Resilient Coastlines program is we never had a minimum standard for a vulnerability assessment. And so finally we have in this legislation that minimum standard. And so we're at, we, we need to ask our communities to go back to any vulnerability assessments that they have completed, 
compare that to the, the detailed requirements in the statute and see where you have data and where you don't. You know, you may need to, to have a conversation with us about looping back and completing some of those items that are in the statute uh, so that we can get that statewide picture. Awesome. So basically, if even if local governments have already done a vulnerability assessment, if it doesn't quite match the state standards, they may still be able to come back to DEP to um, talk to them about expanding that existing study. Correct. And that's what that, you know, planning um, grant funding is for. You know, let us let us work with you to make sure that we get your vulnerability assessments as com complete as possible so that we can we, we don't start when we don't want to start over. Let's see if we can take it all the way um, and complete those um, and, and fill all the requirements of the statute. So we are getting a lot of questions. I'm going to start asking some of them to you all. Uh, some of them, I'm first one I'm going to try and answer, but uh, Rep Busati, you might have to help me here. So one of the questions was specifically about the, and, and Alex, you may have some comment about where that we're leaving um, specifically water and wastewater out of this. Um, and that one of the things that won't be funded is are water quality components for stormwater and wastewater management, except those to mitigate the water quality impacts or expenses related to water quality to obtain a permit for the project. Um, so my understanding is that uh, this is really about flood resilience, that there's a lot of pockets of money out there for uh, water and wastewater, the clean uh, drinking clean and drinking water, state revolving loan funds, things like that. But this was designed to be specifically for resilience projects. And so uh, projects can be funded if the water quality components are a portion of the flood mitigation project, but that this pot of money is not specifically for water quality components, for example. Um, and feel free, either Rep Busada, Hunchofsky, or Alex, if you want to add anything on that. No, you're definitely right on that, Alec. Um, you know, we wanted to make sure that the focus of this was resiliency, sea level rise, and flooding. Uh, there is a lot of money out there that the, the state has allocated um, specifically for water quality projects. Um, and, you know, one of the, the issues that we did allocate uh, funding for this year uh, was septic to sewer conversion, which of course goes hand in hand with water quality. Um, I believe that was also $114 million um, maybe allocated Alex, uh, you know, has a, a better, um, you know, number, but uh, so there are, there is a lot of funding out there already designated for water quality, and we wanted to make sure that the focus of this stayed uh, with sea level rise and flooding. Awesome. And I know that septic to sewer is also something that Rep has uh, spent a lot of time thinking about and working on. The next question, um, so I, I might loop some of these together. So the first is um, really, so what type, who or what type of entities can apply for funding? Um, and then also uh, there was a question about, um, will regional planning councils be eligible applicants? It was my understanding that, um, that, that yes, um, Climate compacts and, and planning councils would be eligible. Um, the regional resilience coalitions is not defined in statute, so that's one of those things that we'll have to define as we move forward in rule. Um, but certainly, um, we ask that that um, any entity that's working in a regional resilience capacity um, that they submit an application and we'll prioritize um, when we when we have all the applications on the table. Awesome and. Um, so another, sorry, I'm just thinking, so um, can a local community submit a project without a vulnerability assessment? It's my understanding that, that we need to start with a vulnerability assessment, and, that, and that's the key there. We want to make sure that, that we're looking at the long game, that, we under, that we've identified those critical assets, the regionally significant assets, and that we have a long-term plan uh, for projects. Doing piecemeal projects that don't have that, that long vision may not get us where we need to go. And just to add to that, Alec, um, you know, part of this was uh, allowing DEP to issue grants to local communities to do a vulnerability assessment. So we obviously recognize that um, some of our local communities uh, don't have the money to do a vulnerability assessment. So there is funding there um, for them to be able to, you know, issue a grant to them to do that assessment. 
awesome. Correct. All right. Then, uh, just okay. just to add on that, you know, and the the point I understand of the regional resilience coalitions was to to find those entities that could help those communities that have not yet developed a uh, vulnerability assessment, give them the technical guidance that they need to get that scope of work for that vulnerability assessment so they can move forward. So I think it it all feeds very well into that that big picture. You already uh, answered the next question I was going to pick from uh, Kate Stein about that specifically making sure that those who don't have regional entities um, are able to start thinking about getting support. Um, awesome. So uh, are there specific types of projects that DEP is looking for um, in, in this, uh, the application process? Not specifically. And if, if you, um read back through the statute, it actually very clearly defines what critical assets um, we need to be focusing on. And there are you know, four categories, everything from transportation to critical infrastructure like wastewater, drinking water, stormwater, um, to um, community um, services, um, hospitals, um, homeless shelters, uh, education centers, and then also uh, natural, cultural, and historic resources. So it's pretty comprehensive of the critical assets that we need to be looking at. Um, and then um, uh, vulnerability assessments need to look at a community-wide system. So they need to be doing that comprehensive assessment. You can't just focus on one little area. And then um, the prioritization for um, implementation projects um, need to look at, at the, I think there's a criteria and I can't quoted off the top of my head, but it looks at um, the planned project and the percentage of critical assets in that community that it addresses. So prioritization is going to be, you know, given to those projects that have the most significant impact within the community. I think that's really important to focus on. And, and if I'm correct, I believe that um, actually regional entities can apply directly to DEP. So um, it is, uh, you know, local governments, the regional entities, um, and basically collections of governments, water management districts, drainage districts. Right. I think the, the idea is to get everyone to submit projects. Yes. Awesome. And so, you know, taking a little break, a lot of these are implementation questions, but I want to make sure we get to a really fun topic, um, specifically for Rep. Pusat and Hadovsky. Where do we go from here? What, what's next for you all um, from a resilience standpoint? I'll start with Rep. Panchofsky. Yeah, to continue to work to keep um, this in the forefront, um, to make it possible for uh, communities to access funding. I think one of the things, and I think you're seeing a lot of that on a lot of the questions today, is how do we make it user friendly for uh, cities and communities to access these grants? I mean, um, coming from a smaller city myself, we don't really have that infrastructure and um, in-house. So I think it's important that not only that we fund these programs and we pass this legislation, but that we also make it user-friendly for everybody to access. And then um, we continue along this path. I would like to think that this is a first step um, in legislation in making sure that our codes and everything are in a way that, um, like I had said earlier, that we're not building today that's going to cause a problem uh, 20, 30 years down the road. So I think it's not just about kind of fixing what we have now and you know shoring up what we have now, but really um, what are we doing now to make sure we're not in a similar situation in the future? And then like you mentioned earlier, the uh, septic to sewer is something that is gonna continually um, be an issue in the state of Florida and something we also need to work toward to make sure um, that that part is taken care of as well. So I, I think uh, just adding to that is part of it too is working with DEP and making sure that they have the tools and resources necessary to, to get this done. Um, you know, it is an extensive bill for sure. Uh, it's, uh, there's, there's a lot to it and there's a lot of um, a work ahead of us and we need to make sure that, you know, sometimes we don't always get it right the first time. So if there's something that DEP needs from us, we need to make sure that we're there for them so they 
can uh, you know, do the best job for our state. And of course, making sure that we get the message out to our local communities. Um, you know, as a, a state representative, we're here to be a liaison for uh, our local uh, coalitions and communities and municipalities and that they have the resources necessary um, and that they, they know and understand that this exists and it's out there. Awesome. And, you know, when you hit a home run like this as a, a freshman, you got, we got, we got high aspirations for future resilience bills now, Rep. Um, awesome. So the next question is about the financially disadvantaged small communities language um, and specifically um, whether it aligns with the current definition of the state. Um, and then are there plans to really engage? You talked about engaging, but making sure we engage with those vulnerable populations. Um, and so before I pass to Alex, I, and I know Rep Busada, this was uh, something that came up quite a bit, um, you know, the fact that one, there's a reduced cost share for, for uh, financially disadvantaged communities, and second, that um, it's actually part of the ranking system that projects specifically focus on supporting uh, disadvantaged communities. And so um, with that, I'm pass it, Rep Busada, if you want to add anything on that, um, and then over to Alex. So, so there is a, a definition um, in the bill, and Alex could probably, you know, speak um, more in depth uh, how that is, I guess, balanced with current definitions and other um, statutes out there. But this was an issue that we saw come up in our first co uh, couple committee hearings, and we just wanted to make sure that, you know, no matter the financial status of a, a community, that they were able to, um, you know, act access, uh, you know, these funds and make sure that their community um, was, you know, prepared for the future. Um, I, I can't remember the exact um, website that we need to use, but I'm happy to share that with Alec and he can circulate to the group. But there's a, um, the disadvantaged communities is a um, per capita comparison to, um, for that community to the rest of the state. And um, I, can, I can give you links to that and information so you can find out just exactly where your community is. Um, but I know that engaging all communities is gonna be critical um, for this legislation. And so um, in addition to just having the, the webpage and the, the application portal available, uh, we know that our team has to make this a priority. Um, and we need to do that in a couple of different ways. Um, we have a quarterly uh, coastal resilience forum that was started in our uh, Florida Resilient Coastlines program, um, started several years ago. Um, we will uh, be continuing to talk about um, this program um, in, in future forums. We're also planning an interim forum. I think the next real uh, regularly scheduled forum is in August. We're going to have an interim in July. Uh, I think that mailing list for that um, group is about 800 um, individuals and entities. So. Uh, we'll have a special um, interim forum just to talk about the program and, and to, to engage as much as we can. Uh, we also know that we need boots on the ground. We need to get to our communities. We need to make sure that they're engaged. Uh, we need to certainly, you know, especially reach out to those communities that have not come to the Resilient Coastlines program yet uh, for a vulnerability uh, a planning grant. Uh, so we, we know that we need to engage those communities. And we also need to start really focusing on our inland communities because they have not uh, previously participated in the Resilient Coastlines Program. So uh, we know that that education and outreach and getting into our communities is going to be critical. So that will be a focus for the coming year as well. And we'll, we'll do that both in person and um, virtually. I know that we can reach more people virtually um, as we start to get staffed up, especially in the beginning. Um, but we, we know that, that reaching out is going to be critical uh, to getting the participation that we need. Awesome, and I'm, I'm making a list of follow-ups and we'll make sure to send a, a follow-up email out to everyone who joined us today. Um, and maybe we can get that mailing list uh, out so folks know how to join it if that works for you. Um, great, and so um, the, there's a series of questions around the same topic. So basically, can communities submit more than one project? Um, you know, and then the other question is like, if, if there are other programs within DEP, can folks submit projects to multiple uh, different programs within DEP? Uh, certainly, uh, submit more than one uh, project, absolutely. Um, they'll all be ranked you know, separately, um, but, but you certainly can submit more than one. 
Uh, can you apply to other programs? Absolutely. Uh, what we're not likely going to be able to do is match a, a state grant for a state grant. Um, we have to be very careful there. Um, and since some of the funding that went into the, the trust fund um, was federal funding, we have to, to also be concerned about um, how we match funds for different projects. So um, there'll be a lot of considerations, um, but uh, certainly um, it's, it's good to apply for as many grants as, as you possibly can um, based on the, the merits of individual projects. Um, there may be a grant that's, that's gonna be more appropriate uh, for the project that you have planned, but uh, we'll just have to look at each one on an individual and case by case basis. And then um, as a kind of follow on on the regional collaborative start, and then I, this is really for Alex, um, what type of projects are you all looking for from these regional resiliency coalitions? Uh, it's a really good question. And um, I don't know that I have the best answer for you. Um, so, um, but what I envision that we need to see are um, coalitions that are going to reach out in, into those communities that have not started their resilience planning and have not started their adaptation measures. Um, find groups of, of communities that, that need that technical assistance and that guidance. Um, and um, we're looking for you know, outcome, you know, what's gonna be the outcome of that coalition? What is, what is the goal of that coalition? Is it to get this entire community to come together and look at their regional assets? Um, I think that would be really important. But, awesome. I, but certainly identifying those, those communities that, that do not have the, the technical capability to work within their own system. And so they need that collaborative partnership. Great, all right. Um, and then are you all going to be drafting uh, you know, a, a grant manual or any sort of material to help, help folks through the application process? Um, yes, we are. Um, I, I think that a program this comprehensive um, needs as much guidance as we, you know, clear, concise guidance as, as we can deliver. Um, I come from the beach management program, um, and we um, have a very, uh, we have a, a tiered prioritization structure for beach management projects. And so the last time we did a, a rule development, we followed that with a ranking methodology uh, document. And so it basically, there was a cut sheet for every criteria. So you have the statute, the rule, and then you know, policy that goes toward the decision-making process for each criteria. That was really helpful for our uh, grant program participants. And I think we can certainly follow up with um, uh, some kind of document like that, that, that takes every piece of this, stat, this uh, legislation and breaks it down into ch ch chunks that are manageable for um, you know, administrations of all levels of sophistication. You know, we, we need to make this accessible we need to make it comprehensive and um, hopefully as concise as possible so, so that people will use it and read it. So we have a ton of questions still outstanding and I know we're gonna, not gonna get all, to all of them today. So if folks have specific questions right now, where can they reach out to? Um, my email is um, alex.read and that's A-L-E-X dot R-E-E-D at floridadep.gov. And we have a um, resilience email um, that I don't know off the top of my head, but I will get it and I will get it in the chat box. And, and that way uh, you'll go straight to our resilience team, but you certainly can email me and I will get that email forwarded on to the right team. Um, and um, uh, we've got contact information on our webpage as well. And we'll get that, um, um, hopefully July 1, we'll have the Protecting Florida Together uh, portal available and there will be more information on that as well. And, and what I will do is I will make sure to take all of the unanswered questions. And um, for those of you who um, submitted these um, on an, that put your name next to them, we'll try and get back to you with some answers. Um, and then we will also try to do a little bit of a write-up on the answers that we um, provided. And I will make sure that our team also sends out uh, the actual link to the legislation so you all can read all of the details. Um, as well, and so I want to make sure you know we we talk a little bit about uh, what what's exciting. So I would love for each of you to talk about what you're most excited about this legislation, um, and you know what it really means to you and your constituents. I guess the constituents part is for Rep. Sad and Hunchowski. So we'll start with Rep. Hunchowski. Yeah, I mean, what I'm most excited about is that it passed. Um, and I know that sounds very simplistic, 
but it really shows that um, this is a priority uh, for our speaker uh, leadership and, and also for the whole um, House of Representatives and uh, for the state of Florida. And I think that's really important because this is something that has been talked about and talked about and talked about. And um, the fact that there was such a comprehensive bill that passed unanimously, I, I think is really amazing, especially in the political times we're in. And so I'm actually most excited about that and most excited that we can bring this information back to our communities, back to our cities, and um, really make sure that this continues to be a top priority so that we're all planning for uh, the bright future of Florida. Great, Rep. Usada. Thank you. And I would have to agree with uh, Representative Hunchowski that I'm most excited that it passed as well. Um, it's still a little bit, you know, uh, unbelievable that we were able to do something like this. Like I said, I think for, for so long, we were kind of behind um, you know, the curve on this. And I think that this will really bring us um, to become leaders in flood mitigation. And hopefully in the future, we can work with other states, other communities, whether it's here, um, you know, in the U.S. or abroad, to to make sure that um, you know we're we're leading the way, and that you know nothing ever becomes stagnant, stagnant, and we're constantly looking to the future and building on this. This is just the beginning, um, because this is something that we are going to have to continually tackle every year. Awesome. Um, we have like one more minute, and there's a good question I want to ask. Will uh, benefit cost ratios, Alex, be required as part of the application process? Uh, it doesn't hurt to include it. Um, so I would add that in if you could. Awesome. Great. Thank you, Rep. Hunchofsky, for putting the legislation in the chat. Uh, for those of you who um, want to uh, explore it in detail, um, it is now in your chat. And we'll also send it as a follow-up. Uh, I think I refer to it as House Bill 7019, but uh, because of procedure, it's technically Senate Bill 1954. So um, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll save that one for another day. Um, also, awesome. So Alex, I, I'd love to just end with what are you most excited about with this legislation? You know, I the, the legislation is really exciting. Um, and most importantly, it was so significantly supported with funding. So we can follow through. So I think that's really put us in, in put the, the state in a great position to be successful. And so um, I'm just really excited that, um, that DEP gets to go out into the communities and offer them the support um, that the legislature um, has provided. So I'm just really, really excited to, to be in this team. Well, it is uh, my honor to be uh, moderating this uh, panel of rock star women. Um, and it, it just excites me um, to really see what we can do when we come together. Uh, you know, Republicans, Democrats, doesn't matter. Um, you know, I, I, I say it a lot. It, as Floridians, we can accomplish a lot when we roll up our sleeves and just work together. And so, um, you know, as a, a moment of personal privilege, the three of you are just uh, fantastic individuals that I, I'm lucky enough to work with on a daily basis. So thank you for taking the time to talk with everyone today um, and really providing such great guidance on what's next. And um, I know, Alex, everyone's going to be looking forward to that interim forum to really hear, uh, you know, the, the nitty gritty details of, of how they can get these dollars. And, and thank you, Rep. Hunchofsky and Rep. Busada for your efforts on this legislation and, and putting the money behind it, because uh, the amount of money is not no, no small feat. Um, so thank you both, or all three of you. And um, it is my pleasure. I get to pass it over to Anna Baker, who is our uh, senior outreach director to close us out um, for this webinar. And um, she will also provide our contact information for any follow-up. So again, thank you all. And Anna, take us away. Great. Thank you, Alec. Uh, and in addition to Alex and my contact information, again, we'll be sure to circulate the, the other contacts that we just described um, and were mentioned and the links. Um, but thanks again for everyone 
in taking part in today's discussion of this landmark legislation. Uh, what we heard today and what we know is that Florida is on the front lines of this issue every day facing the impacts of more frequent flooding and rising seas and this legislation is a major step forward in preparing for the future. So thank you again to the panelists for your important work on this and for sharing your insights today and for all the questions from the audience. Uh, as Alec mentioned, we at the American Flood Coalition work with over 100 coalition members across Florida including about 60 local governments. And uh, I want to personally thank all of our Florida coalition members from mayors to council members, business and civic leaders and others all across the state for the work that you've done to seek local solutions and share the stories of these vital issues statewide and nationally. Uh, as Rep Punchofsky said so well, these issues touch all communities and the actions of local leaders is such a critical piece of promoting and advancing solutions like this legislation. Um, for those of you who don't know us well yet at AFC, we're here as a resource to you as you seek to advance solutions in your own communities to flooding and sea level rise. In addition to Alec serving as our Florida director and in that capacity moderating and, and prompting discussions like this, to move us forward, we have a staff of 30 focused on advancing these solutions locally at the state level and nationally. And on a daily basis, we're working with our over 260 coalition members across 20 states and also engaging with leaders at the congressional level where we've recognized 21 members of Congress as federal champions on these issues. Uh, so we've talked a lot today about why this legislation and the funding we're seeing along with it uh, is such a historic moment for Florida. And by putting this stake in the ground, Florida is truly uh, modeling for the rest of the country what flood resilience legislation can look like. Uh, it's a tremendous signal um, of a commitment as we've heard from our panelists. And at, on the coalition side, we've heard from many of our coalition members across the country who are interested in using this framework in their own states, exchanging ideas across state lines in terms of how to build resilience and be better prepared for the future. And just recently, we've also seen legislation introduced in North Carolina that draws on what you've done in Florida. And we're excited to be working with local partners and state level leaders there as well. Uh, and with that, you know, we have experts predicting yet another active hurricane season. The, the need to invest in flood resilience has never been more urgent. And on that note, we're just, again, so pleased to see this vital step in Florida and to find ways for adopting similar approaches across the country. So um, wrapping up our time today, thank you again uh, to Alec for your moderation to Ellen for your intro, to our panelists for your focus and leadership on this issue. And, and thanks again to everyone for joining us today. Uh, so until next time, we hope everyone has a safe 4th of July and an enjoyable one. And we look forward to the next steps of implementing this important work.